Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks for joining me this morning. All right, today, 1 Chronicles chapter 6, a uh, very long chapter that deals just with the tribe of Levi. However, it's going to be a relatively short devotional. As we continue looking at the longest genealogy in the Bible, verse 49, But Aaron and his sons offered sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering and on the altar of incense for all the work of the most holy place, and to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. Matthew Henry opens his commentary on this chapter as follows. Quote, Though Joseph and Judah shared between them the forfeited honors of the birthright, yet Levi was first of all the tribes, dignified and distinguished with an honor more valuable than either the precedency or the double portion, and that was the priesthood. That God, that, that tribe God had set apart for himself. It was Moses' tribe, and perhaps for his sake was thus favored. All right, however, before we continue, I want to go back to one chapter that we read last time, but we've not discussed, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, where we found one of those gems of truth that we've discussed are hidden within the lines of, the, of this genealogy. So chapter 5, verse 17, very quickly. All of these were registered by genealogies in the days of Jotham, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, king of Israel. The sons of Reuben, the, the Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had 44,760 valiant men, men able to bear shield and sword, to shoot with the bow, and skillful in war, who went to war. They made war with the Hagrites, Jeter, Naphish, and Nodab. And they were helped against them, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them. For, listen, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer because <clears throat> they put their trust in him. Then they took away their livestock, 50,000 of their camels, 200, and 50,000 of their sheep, and 2,000 of their donkeys, and 100,000 of their men. For men fell dead because the war was God's, and they dwelt in their place until the captivity. Now the sons of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, as you'll recall, were on the east side of the Jordan. And here are three, what, I, what I saw here in these few verses were three aspects of the manner of their conduct, which is worth exploring. Number one, they acted on the Word of God. God gave them a promise that they were going to have this land, but they had to act upon it. Look at verse 22. It says, because the war was God's. Now, this battle was not their, theirs. They were fighting it, but it was the Lord's. They had to show up. They could not fight this battle from their couch. They couldn't fight it from their tent. You see, God's promises that he's given to you, he's given to me, we have to fight for them. They're not just going to be delivered to us. We have to stand for them. We have to pursue them. Number two is they called upon God for help. They were prepared. Look, they were skilled warriors. They had trained for this. They were prepared. Remember, they went before the other tribes when they crossed over into the Promised Land, and they fought for seven years. So these were well-trained, well-equipped men. They prepared, and they participated in God's plan. They were pursuing God's plan, but difficulties arose. And what did they do? They cried out to God. They asked for help. It's one of the things we have to realize, just because God is in it doesn't mean that others won't be against it. As you are pursuing the promises of God in your life, if you are doing all the Word of God tells us to do in pursuing Him and standing upon the promises of His Word, expect opposition. And that's why we need to continually be in prayer. That's why part of our motto at the Family Research Council, pray, vote, stand. We need to be praying, we need to be engaged, and we need to be resolute in standing for that truth. And then here's why their prayers worked. This is the third element. They believed. They trusted God. Hebrews eleven six 6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, being God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And we read this recently from David in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I just wanted to go back and share that because I was encouraged by that as I read that 
uh, this weekend, and I'm, I feel pretty certain that someone else needed to hear that encouraging word, that we need to pursue the promises of God. We need to act upon those promises. We need to call upon Him for help, even in the midst of that pursuit, knowing that opposition is going to arise, but we have to have confidence and trust in God, believing in His promises and in His word. All right, let's go back to chapter 6. All right, we're going to begin in verse 1. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebram, and Uzel. The children of Amram were Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Eleazar begot Phinehas, and Phinehas begot Ab Abish, Ab Abishua. So, don't you love these names? So we have uh, the three sons of Levi, which will provide the three houses of the tribe of Levi. Of special note is that God elevates the line of the second son, Kohath, to a more prominent role, as these are the ones who were um, given the task of handling the holiest things, which we read back in Numbers chapter 4. Now Moses and Aaron were from the line of Kohath. Aaron's line was then chosen as the priest, the line of priests, which we read in, in, in verse 40, which we read in verse 49. But Aaron and his sons offered sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering and on the altar of incense for all the work of the most holy place and to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. Now these are the sons of Aaron, Eleazar, his son, Phinehas, his son, Abishua, his son. Notice um, anything missing in verse 50 compared to verse 3? Look. This, is, uh, this was different. The line of Aaron went to the third son, Eleazar. The reason? Remember Nadab and Abihu? Remember what they did? They offered the strange fire on the altar and they were killed by God. And so it goes to the third son. So where did the singers in the temple come from? Remember, this was a part of David's organizing of the Levites and administering the things of God. Well, we read that in verse 33. And these are the ones who ministered with their songs. One of the sons of the Kohathites were Heman, the singer, and the son of Joel, the son of Samuel. Now, each of these three houses of Levi were represented among the singers. Now, I'm not sure how they made it into this select choir. Maybe they had tryouts. I don't know. But as I mentioned, uh, and this is why we need to kind of pay attention to these genealogies, they can be dry, but often hidden just below the surface are, are, are really gems of encouragement and revelation. Look at, look at uh, Haman, the, uh, who was the son of Joel, uh, the son of Samuel, the last priest, prophet, and judge. Remember what was said about Samuel's sons. We, we read that back in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In fact, let me go back and read that. The name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his way. They turned after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. So while Joel did not follow in his father's footsteps and serve the Lord, his grandson did. So this is encouraging. Just because one generation walks contrary to God doesn't necessarily mean the next generation will do the same. And so... You know, we, we never want to give up on our, our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We need to continue to plant those seeds and, and provide an example to them. Verse 39, and his brother Asaph, who stood at his right hand. Asaph was a, a prophet and a seer as well as a singer. 44, their brethren, the sons of Merari, on the left were Ethan, the sons of Kishai. Now remember these names because we're going to see them again when we read through the Psalms as they were among the authors represented in that uh, wonderful book of praise. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And, and again, Lord, thank you that you recognize individuals, that you're calling upon our lives. And each one of us, Lord, we are known by you. And if, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, meaning that we, we believe in our heart that you raised him from the dead, that we might be forgiven of our sins be, through his sacrificial uh, giving of his life on the cross. And if we confess that he is Lord, 
that we believe that we will be saved. That's what your word says. And, and, and Lord, I thank you for that, that then our name is written in the book of life. And so, Father, I pray that through these uh, stories, these accounts of the lives of these people who, who lived thousands of years ago, but it's recorded for us today, may we be encouraged and may we be people, may we live as people that you would write about in your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that's leading us on this journey. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks again for being with me this morning. And I do want to encourage you, if you've not yet downloaded the Stand Firm app, it makes it even easier uh, to access uh, our resources on the Bible reading and walk in community with others who are doing the same. Until next time, keep standing on the Word.